Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. So um, we're going to have a fly through the birth of some environment work for Wolfenstein 2, the project. Just out of curiosity, how many people have played the game or at least are familiar with it, like the visuals? OK, cool. OK, for those who haven't played the game and still planning to, we're going to be focusing mainly on the very final uh, level where basically all the closing events happen. And so we're going to talk about how the story ends and all of that, so gigantic spoiler. <laughs> if you still want to play the game, then probably get some a portal battle and knock yourself out after this so you forget everything. <laughs> there's going to be a little Q&A. I will try to squeeze everything so there's going to be some time for a Q&A. So if you, something triggers any question, just please save it for later and I'm going to try to answer. So first things first, uh, what is this Treehouse Ninja thing? You probably are familiar with some of the names that you saw amongst the company invited to this conference, like Framestore, Ubisoft, and such. And you might be wondering, what is this thing? So this is a new company. It sometimes happens also. And um, uh, we bought, basically the founders of this company, we both come from different uh, backgrounds, movies and games. And we thought it was about time to just try to create something independent uh, that kind of merges things together. Because this year is kind of actually uh, happening for, for real, the convergence between movies and games. So we're trying to do both things. And I mean, it's a new studio, but made by not so new people, let's say, because we've been around for a while. And uh, uh, so the Ninja Factor is a little bit like we try not to specialize too much. We try to stay generalist and uh, not stick with a single software. So we basically pick up the softwares that we're using based on basically what is best for the task. And uh, we all have our, have our own fortes, so we're good at something, we're better at something, but we try to just like, push everybody to do a little bit of everything. And the treehouse factor is a little bit like we try to keep it fun and go, come in the morning at work, um, making sure we, we just like what we're doing. And we recently are really proud to have received the official certificate for bullshit free working environment, which these days is really rare. This is some of the project behind us before starting the company. So this is what I mean when, when I say it's like new company, but not so new people that made it. So, uh, so we made a company and we say, hey, let's make a video game. So we called our friends in Sweden, Machine Games, and we told them so. And they say, hey, that's cool. We actually happen to be making one already. And we, we need some help to do some good stuff. And so we said, uh, uh, that's cool because by coincidence, good stuff is exactly what we like to do. <laughs> and uh, so we, we flew to Sweden and we started figuring out how we could help. And so we specialize in environment, mainly everything that is non-character for now. And uh, big challenge at the beginning was we got in charge of a few environments, mainly uh, the final ones and a few more later. And for a bunch of logistic reasons, we couldn't have the, the game engine locally, but we still had to deliver final uh, environments that would go to the game just as they are. They would just need to work uh, uh, delivery time. And we couldn't really test it in the actual technology, um, plus uh, the actual assembly of the environments uh, happens in the level editor, and we, that's part of the technology. So we had to figure out a way to independently, in-house, put together the environment and uh, um, and also give them a look that would be exactly the one uh, that we were expecting to be in the, in the game, so that they wouldn't need to sort of tweak our things and make it look good after our delivery. And uh, we solved that problem, and I'm gonna tell you how a little bit later. So uh, visual style, um, this game takes place in an alternative history where the Germans, had the, I mean, the, yeah, the Germans have been the um, Second World War, and uh, so America is literally invaded by them. And so the references that we were given were the German Nazi brutalism, which is something that actually I discovered while working. I didn't know there was such a thing. It's a little bit of a blend of uh, Art Deco and, uh, and neoclassicism to a certain extent, but a lot of accents on like really aggressive cubic shapes. And the pop culture of the 50s in America, which is something that we are pretty much familiar from, American graffiti, uh, Days like that, movies like that. 
Um, so it was basically a Nazifies epides, and this is one of the first concept art that we were fed with, and uh, it kind of summarizes it. You can see it's just America in the 50s and, uh, and a little bit of Nazi uh, influence here and there. So basically, this is what we were trying to do, <laughs> actually. Um, so references, like very important as always, we just went through a lot of uh, pictures that were like meaningful to us, to what were the designs uh, at that time, and generally very sim simplistic. And along with the reference to follow, we were also uh, fed with the references not to follow, like the pub level sort of 60s uh, fiction. Um, tools wise, we were uh, centered on model. We were using it for doing our assemblies and ZBrush for sculpting and the substance uh, suit for uh, painting texture look deving Photoshop is always there. Uh, and then for final testing, we were bridging things from Modo to Unity uh, to have a real-time response and then some nav actual navigation and, and look at the whole environment before we just send it off. So uh, let's see a little bit the, the, the process, how these things come together. So um, it's, it's, it's a three-pass process. The, start from a plan, which is a block out in the first, second, and final environment. So the block out is basically, you know, in, in games, uh, unlike movies, um, is, it, the picture has to be good, but the most important thing is the game plays fun. And so testing the, the game requires a lot of flexibility, which can happen ideally uh, moving around just like gray boxes and figuring out what are the dynamics that are going to make it fun and establish a little bit the rhythm depending on the mood and how the progression of the story is in that specific part of the game. Um, so with a very rough one, we get into the first pass, which is building the, the actual basic structures of the environment. The second pass is just making it look good with set dressing and extra things. Um, so this is an example of uh, the actual final TV studio where uh, the game ends, the player starts from here. This little thing here, uh, this is the target. I will show you a little bit more about the story, what happens here in a second. But basically, it was split into a first corridor, uh, director's room, because this is a TV studio, so these are the tribunes. This is the director's t um, room. And basically, the player would start from here and find his way all the way up. And it was more of a stealth kind of section of the game, uh, it wouldn't require too much shooting because you know, the heavy part was already gone. Uh, but the tension needed to be preserved a lot. And eventually you would walk all the way up to this catwalk, go down and kill the final enemy. So this is how a first pass would look like. It's just setting together the, the, the building blocks and basically all of those pieces that represent the clipping areas where you can walk, where you cannot walk, defining the boundaries, and uh, I must say that it also sometimes includes a little bit of a color pass because the lighting team might want to start and test some lighting response. But I didn't include it because it looks really nasty. It's just beautiful, like a cost and colors and just like tileable textures. It's just to have some kind of color there. Um, so very simplistic at the first pass, but it does set things for us to move on and start doing all the other items. We could never start doing these unless there is a good solid first pass because uh, we will be wondering where these things are actually going and we will be probably prioritizing the picture instead of the gameplay. So this is the same second pass from the other perspective. And this is a top down of the final dressed environment with textures. Um, so this is another example from the um, director's room. Um, well, keep an eye on these, uh, these consoles, the shape they are, because I'm going to tell you a little bit something interesting about that. As you can see, they, they changed a little bit during the progress. And this is how things happen to be sometimes when you have to prioritize how the story evolves in the, in the game, how the rhythm is, and what happens according to the gameplay. This is how a blockout camera looks like, for example, from the blockout stage. So it's, it doesn't look like much, really. It's just a boundary. It's just a thing that is there, hey, there's going to be a camera. First pass, it starts looking like something. And then after the second pass, it's ready to go for look dev inside of uh, Substance. Um, so about the, how the story develops here. So um, we find ourselves at the end of the game. Um, so this is the main enemy. This is basically the, she is the guest of a talk show. It's a, literally a fake propaganda Nazi talk show. Uh, she is like the, the commander of the armies, uh, Nazi armies in the States. And everybody thinks that you, as a player, have died because she actually chopped your head off. But I've met scientists just that find a way to 
to just stick it back in position and, and nobody knows that you're still alive and you're going for her still. So this is what the, te the stealth and tension factor comes from. So in the environment, she's sitting there. I hope this is clear enough. So she's here and this is from the television show. Um, so that's our target right there. This is her in the, envir in the environment. So basically we start getting in from, from the corridor. These are our friends. Um, get the door and this is inside of the control room of the, of the TV studio. Couple of secondary room, then you crawl back behind the tribunes inside. There is a little elevator that brings us uh, up then to the catwalk, and then from the catwalk we can actually see the scene uh, without ourselves being seen because it's really dark, everybody's looking at the stage. And we can actually uh, witness the interview, she's actually bragging about uh, killing you, and she's saying <coughs> the entire nation, hey, I called the guy, but she doesn't know what's gonna happen now. Um, we go all the way through the, to the catwalk, again, down, and then there is this final conversation with her in an, with an hatchet in his face. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I drag your attention on this console, for example, because uh, this is the, the concept art that we get. So this is an interesting, interesting comparison that we can make. Because my background is in movie. I represent the, like, the movie side of the company. And uh, in my experience, concept art has been mainly the contract that you, as an artist, you get when you start making a shot or a sequence. Um, in the case of games, uh, as I said before, is the gameplay. So sometimes we need to compromise. So this is uh, before delivery, how environment would look like. And if you look um, at these guys, they have been chopped, as I said before. And the reason is because uh, um, from this perspective, one of our friends is actually standing right behind there. And we figured out that after characters were put in the environment and there was some, a little bit more of um, st more storytelling happening in terms of like non-interactive gaming. And uh, so we said, if he stands right there and he tells us some something, we're gonna hear a voice that we don't know who's talking. You know, so eventually we have to reshape. This is just a small example, but this stuff kind of happens uh, pretty often, um, even though the blocking stage kind of ensures that we are pretty solid on that side. But it's obviously it's an evolving process. So this is the gameplay friendly version of it. So the first pass starts by, you know, La Plan, like all serious things. And uh, so um, we try to split the environment into sectors. So all of these letters are sectors. That's very useful to be able to assign all the involved artists uh, something more than a list of little assets. It keeps everybody's purpose much more uh, alive to be in charge of a portion of the environment instead of like a little piece that maybe belonging to this corner and then another one tomorrow belonging to that corner. You're actually developing your own thing. And, uh, and then there is a breakdown of what are the components of those sectors which actually become the asset, which can eventually be split into sub-assets if they are big ones. And these little blobby shapes is actually us trying to anticipate since the beginning where the light is going to be to try and make a, mm, compromises and say where the most uh, amount of love would have to go because you don't want to waste that too much in the dark areas. Um, so references again, a lot of looking at pictures and figuring out uh, the style. Even, even, though, even though sometimes you might feel very comfortable with something that you even done in the past, you know, looking at pictures is always the only way to, to trigger some ideas that you might put there. Um, so I mentioned before that we didn't have the, um, the level editor, but we still had to assemble as the environment internally. And how did we do that? Um, so this is inside of Modo, our, our work assembling the scene. And as you can see, our final result, like this is the example of uh, studio lamps. There are many of them. And you know, as you know, in games, we try to reuse a lot of things. And there are many assets that are actually reused over and over. We didn't have the option to, to just uh, send them. This is the list of the assets now. Just put together the, the level and environment uh, like you think it's going to be. We had to send something, but we didn't have the level engine. So we basically had to, to dig a little bit into the Python API of Modo. And we, come, uh, to, we just put together this new uh, file format, which THN stands for uh, Trios Ninjas. Uh, it's just a simple um, 
text-based uh, uh, sort of prefab files that basically uh, they go in pair with every single asset. Every single asset has uh, one of these. And it's basically a list of positional information that are acquired from the scene that we build and uh, is literally translation, rotation, scaling, and instancing um, across the whole environment. So we passed over our Python code to the guys at Machine Games, which thankfully there's plenty of clever people there, and they figure out a way to read that back in the, in the inside of the level. So ourselves, by providing a set of assets already assembled by us, paired with the THN files, we basically, in one click, allow them to just bring the environment together. The other slight problem was also the look of it, because uh, the engine has got its own rendering technology, and we were seeing things close to final inside of Substance Painter. And so we had to send back and forth a few times a few assets with screenshots and say, how do you actually see these in the engine? Show us, seeing the passes. And we basically figured out that this is a little bit more glossy, this is a little bit less, and find out the calibration of some offsets to just get the look right. So we would know that if something is going to look a little bit more glossy in the engine, we would like make it look just slightly rougher locally. Uh, and then we developed uh, another set of tools, which would uh, just make it a little bit faster for everybody to work. We call it Chinani tools, which is from the Hungarian to do. It's an internal joke. Um, and what the tools were doing automatically were picking up the scene, storing the information of the positioning of the assets inside of the um, THN files, applying position just to rebuild the environment, refresh objects in position in case another artist, while you are working on an assembly of the environment, would export a new THN file, and so you would be able to just not rebuild from scratch the environment, but like uh, refresh that asset only. And then uh, um, also to allow people to work uh, on one asset, but also being aware of, it, of its running, uh, apply objects, building the environment relative to where the asset you're working on is in the origin. Uh, apply material apply material attacks by items of face selection, and then inside of model we were generating automatically a uh, material stack using the um, the Unity materials that would be uh, make it really fast for us reading the um, um, tags assignment inside of the mesh, assigning uh, texture automatically and creating a stack because they would bridge automatically into Unity, and we would ha we wouldn't have to reassign all the materials inside of Unity. We just like export straight into Unity, just a giant FBX and get it done. Uh, there was a Ninja Baker tool to automatize all the normal baking because you know, there are many, many pitfalls hidden in the, in the baking process. Um, and then a bunch of sanity checks, uh, like to check namings uh, and uh, all sorts of grid snapping and all of those things that you don't want your client to, to inherit from your work. All of that stuff that allows you to just send something and you know that they have got their own problems already with the game. They don't, you don't want to create more for them, which is that something that just works. So this is how a final uh, delivery package would look at, uh, like for us. As you can see, it's a pair of assets, a pair of files. It's LWO is the mesh file format of a model. Excuse me. And the THN file, which is basically uh, paired with it. And these uh, packages would be enough for, to just populate the, the whole environment in one go. Eventually, uh, this environment was 183 unique assets which instance were 21, uh, 2,140. And that was the work of uh, five artists in three months, uh, two of which were a little bit more juniorish, so they kind of progressed into the training um, with it, but eventually we made it on time. Uh, one little consideration, because we spoke about uh, the game factor, but there is another thing, because like cinematics uh, today, like, you know, uh, pre-rendered cinematics are kind of dying. So everybody wants to see the cinematics going. Uh, inside of the real-time engine, and um, cinematics are happening uh, where the game environment is, so you need to be aware of that uh, because you definitely want to stage things to accommodate potential interesting framing. And this is the final cinematic of the, of the game that happens basically because uh, the, the bad lady gets killed on this desk and she's still on air. This camera is, is basically broadcasting across America and they're having this patriotic talk about uh, freeing uh, America from the Nazis, and it lasts quite a lot. So we tried to basically bring down some uh, um, some lamps and create a little bit of set dressing just to avoid having it flat and create a little bit of an opportunity for whoever would have decided the final camera to frame it nicely. Um, so um, 
we carry on talking about you know comparisons between movies and games, and uh, this is something that is going to probably grow more and more. Uh, it is already with the you know more immersive storytelling and VR and 360 degrees movies and short movies. It's very the, I mean the big challenge is the fact you cannot decide where the audience is going to look at, which is the, the big gain of working on movies versus games. Um, so we try to. Um, uh, divide everything into primary, secondary, and tertiary uh, POVs to create a little bit of a uh, hierarchy of interest. Uh, imagining that this is the player, uh, the player path, for example, in a linear environment, you just want to have a primary POV which the, basically encloses what is the most interesting, but what, where you want the player to look at most likely. And that's where the majority of the artistic love goes into, the compositional uh, crafting. Secondary POV is obviously what is very likely to be noticed, but not necessarily. Tertiary POV is the stuff that still has to look good, but is probably going to be a little bit more um, left behind, especially if not, not much of a stealth sequence and it's more of a shooting Nazis everywhere. Probably the player will miss a lot of that. Um, other situation where there are multiple points of interest is the same thing. Um, you might be talking and, and shooting at the same spot, and there might be different enemies or whatever. It just it's very helpful to think of it in terms of primary, secondary, and tertiary, just to avoid getting lost into crafting every single detail from day one and literally losing a lot of time. Um, so right here, settle and keep the purpose. So this is where you try to drive the attention of the, of the player, which is a bit of a challenge sometimes. So the main goal and objective of the level is the number one focus that keeps the player motivated and engaged. And in this case, this is the very end of the game, and the climax is meant to be at its, uh, the, the tension is meant to be at its climax. This is a little bit of like, you know, even, even in narrative and literature, is a bit of like a rule. Um, so if we lose the purpose of the gamer, uh, the tension is gone. We, we are literally risking to screwing up the entire game because the end is pretty much of a landmark. So imagining this is where the player goes into the environment from. That's where the, 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 the lady stands in. This is a little bit of a, the same thing that we saw just before applied to the environment itself. Um, that is basically where we want to put the most of the craft and try to uh, lead the story and the rhythm from. Um, so this is how it looks from the primary POV section. And uh, this is our target. So basically, eventually, the composition of the whole thing, it follows those you know, composition rules that were figured out some 500 years ago by the master painters. And we still apply them literally on everything today. Um, even the, you see the profile of the, of the crowd, and, uh, which is fake, actually. It's, uh, it's cardboard people because nobody likes the Nazis. Uh, and the camera, they're actually still trying to force in some kind of curve, some kind of directionality, so that we are stating to the player, that's, that's your interest, that this is what you have to go for, and this is your purpose. So we make sure we don't lose him. Um, so asset-wise, uh, it's a bit of a standard um, process. Uh, we just craft a high poly, and we try to save as much as we can. It's low poly, we try to make it as low as possible and make the most of the of the normal baking, uh, which happens in, in model and then the texture inside of Painter. This is inside of Painter how a, one of the assets would look like after texturing. Uh, you see it's very simplistic, but then eventually, obviously, with a little bit of craft, it just, we make it look a little bit more interesting. And this is assuming that it's going to be part of, the, of a bigger, uh, bigger sector. Um, this is an, a typical output of our PBR textures. So we were using the spec gloss uh, uh, paradigm. Um, so these are a few more assets. This is from the um, studio, TV studios. This is one of the sectors of the workstations, screens, cranes. This is from the stage area. This is the famous desk, some paneling, and, uh, and this is the final game. You can see this is the original concept art that we received, and then eventually this is the final look. And same thing here is concept art for the conception and, and then uh, the final environment in the game. Um, and um, this is another environment that we were involved with, which is a, a destroyed Manhattan subway section, which w was a little bit more of a, of a fragging uh, section of the game where we're shooting everywhere. Uh, but this is an interesting part to just uh, mention very quickly about uh, optimizing resources, which is still, and it will be for a long time, uh, uh, 
a requirement in games because they have to run fast no matter what. Um, eventually, uh, there are a few things that we can do to build um, environments modularly. And we basically, we can rely on the fact that the player doesn't record every single visual component of the environment uh, unless it's really badly overused. Um, it will mainly spot the stuff that is repeated in the same framing, so you can reuse a lot of things and be clever about it. But the problem is that if you want to do realistic stuff, um, it, that really requires custom detailing, and custom detailing obviously doesn't work everywhere. So it's a little bit of a, of a, of a challenge. Um, <coughs> industrial environments most of the times are the ones that just serve themselves a little bit better for um, modular work because in reality the actual manufacturers of the, of the construction pieces, they want to keep their business sustainable by reusing the things. But that doesn't prevent us from uh, injecting a little bit of love and details in it. We just have to be careful about a bunch of things. And you know, apart from the consistency in scale and the grid snapping and all the pivot position, the whole generic uh, rule is obviously to stay very generic and, uh, and, and try not to create things that would be easily uh, recognizable. And the important thing is that uh, decals and, and layer shaders are very much of a, of, a, of a helper in this because that is what injects the opportunity for having uh, custom stuff. And uh, so this is some renders of our uh, modules for the, for the subway station as we delivered them. And you can see wall. There is nothing that is particularly visible, but everything has got a little bit of detail, and this is easy to repeat without you noticing too much uh, of the trick. So ceilings, pillars, and, uh, and uh, flooring. And this is the actual uh, subway in, in the final game. So since we're st uh, talking about uh, um, um, re re reusability and optimizing resources, I'm going to give you bad news because like we've, be, we've been often seeing this improvement in the computing power and we're always looking forward for, like there's going to be one day we're not going to have to care about anything of this. We just chuck everything in and the computer is going to be so powerful it's going to run 60 FPS no matter what. That will not, it's just not going to happen. And the reason is if we look at the, how things progressed in the last three years, um, you see like the graphics um, improve the computing power improves. However, the, gaming expe the gamer's expectation also improves, and, uh, and the kind of uh, experiences that we are trying to build becomes much, much more complicated. So um, this is why I say this stuff ha is going to have to run in VR. VR is way much more complicated. It's going to be stereo. It's going to be higher resolution. It's, it cannot drop under uh, 60 FPS. And so uh, generally, um, there's going to be just more requirements. So things are going to look better. But the ratio between how painful it is to make them work properly is, is not really going to change too much because we're going to be doing much more complex stuff. A um, couple of notes about, uh, uh, you know, still about splitting things into three stages or three um, break, broken down steps of, uh, of seeing pictures from. It's, it's very important every time we craft something, we try to create a broad mid frequency and high frequency shape because basically it's, that's how things look appealing in nature and in everything that humans have been crafted with. There is a, always a balance of these uh, forms. So as you can see in red, the broad, uh, the broad shapes, the mid shape. We try to keep in consideration always this thing. It's very easy to get lost into bringing an environment uh, together if we're not able to create a hierarchy of how the uh, the whole environment turns into a picture. So how we apply into the and this is really applying on literally everything. With no exception, this is why I just prepared it on water. Uh, that's not an exception. We still have broad shapes. We have this mid frequency shape and then the high frequency ones. And then once you get into this mentality, you can see yourself these things happening in pretty much every single picture. You can see here without any help that it, you can see the broad shape, the mid level, and the high frequency ones. And there is no exception again. It's just like this happens on everywhere. Um, you can break those rules like you can do with most of the rules, but you do that consciously sometimes. Like you, so I wouldn't do that unle unless you really want to. Uh, fire is very easy to see as well. And the same thing is, uh, uh, is for materials and shaders. So one thing is shape. This is details 
on shaders is still low, mid, and high frequency. So when you break down a shader and you tackle it, it's always the same. It's just to create a procedural structure, there is no way you can do it unless you have a breakdown like this. And the same goes with everything. So you can look at these pictures and get yourself trained into breaking it down into different levels. It's literally, there is no exceptions. So um, geared up with these weapons, we tackled another environment which was the Venus station in the game, uh, which required basically picking up a lot of these references to create uh, different console styles. Um, we were also helped with some concept art, and, but we basically had to steal um, shapes from reference pictures by cataloging them into broad, mid frequency, and high frequency. And so these are a few of the renders of the final asset for the Venus station. Uh, as you can see, um, you know, everything is consistent. So the, the challenge here is to consistent, uh, achieve variety with consistency. So consistency is very easy to achieve if you are repeating the same stuff over, over and over, but you're making it boring, really. Um, stealing the components of broad, mid, and high frequency ones, creating a catalog for you, allows you to create combination uh, of shapes and forms and details that still, still belong to the same visual um, world in general. So everything is consistent. You can tell that it just, it, it's come from there, but, uh, but it's not the same thing repeated over and over. So this is the Venice station um, in the game. Okay, and then a uh, couple of, um, this is really would require a special lecture because it's a very big thing, but um, the PDR um, standards have been a bit of, of the holy grail of VFX and, and games for a very long time, and 2010, 2011, it started actually settling down. As of today, it's a little bit the standard, so this has been really important references for us to just um, stick in the range and make sure that everything responds to light uh, properly, um, uh, regardless of the lighting conditions. Um, so, uh, as I say, this probably would require a different lecture, but, um, but this was an extremely important thing because uh, environmental lighting is really something that, that cannot, be, uh, cannot be divided. If anybody tells you it can be divided, don't believe it. It's, it's, it's not right. All right, and a final, final word of advice, since this is a school. Um, it's very easy uh, when, uh, when you start working in the industry to be super excited about things, because like, we, we all have, we all start these works, regardless of if it is games or movies, we start because something triggered our interest, some kind of something sparked something in our head when we were kids probably, a movie, a game, everybody has got his own little trigger, they say it can be Indiana Jones or Star Wars or whatever, Monkey Island, you name it. Um, and it's always about a product, it's never about one detail of that game. Unfortunately, details of the game is what the actual product is made of. And I'm using the word product with a reason because this is business as well. So there are companies that are investing a lot of money in this. And, uh, and this is not just about making something very artistic, fulfilling, it's also money. And uh, uh, at the beginning, you know, at the beginning of a production, there are, if you imagine that this is, a, this is a, mm, a product, a game or a movie, there are certain people that are in charge of defining the, uh, the main points of the whole product, to shape it in broad strokes, which is, a, is basically a blend of art directors, supervisors, and producers. Uh, as you start in the industry, you will most likely not going to be one of these people. And, and that's good because it's very difficult and you don't want your reputation screwed up before you even have one. Um, so uh, following those people, you have other secondary roles that just interpolate. Whoever is a confident with animation knows this from in-betweening and, and keyframing. But there are different levels of people just filling in the spots and getting a certain level of initiative. But you're never going to design the new Millennium Falcon if you're working on Star Wars, and you're never going to redesign uh, the protagonist of a video game if you're working on it. You're probably going to be in one of the teams that will be doing this work. And uh, these are actually teams of people, not single people. So uh, the point is that there are lots of people. There, has been, there is a legacy of, of, of saying this is a small industry, 
is kind of changing. It's not too much of a small industry anymore. This is what we used to say 10 years ago. It's now getting pretty big and it's very competitive. And uh, it's very easy in your every, everyday work to get lost into small problem, problems like this software is crashing, this little detail is not working. Uh, the secret of uh, endurance and basically getting the mileage and getting experience is just trying to enjoy the journey and, and, and the destination at the same time. Um, so I, what I would suggest to anybody that is, will join the industry soon is to, uh, you will find yourself in struggling with something and you will lose the point of why you're doing that. It's just gonna be one 3D mesh or one little piece of code that just doesn't want to work. The trick is really to just forget everything about that and just take yourself out and look at the product. Just look at what it is that the whole um, process is gonna produce at the end. It's a nice video game, it's a nice movie, it's something that you really want to be part of. And uh, so that is a really big weapon against frustration and just carry on against <laughs> all the difficult things that just happen every day because life is just hard. <laughs> okay, thank you, that's it. Thank you very much. Is there any question? Oh, what was that? The camera that we saw, that one in the before, how many polygons? How many polygons was that one? <laughs> it's, yeah, I think that one could have been at the end, uh, like a thousand triangles for the high poly, yeah. Oh no, sorry, my, the final one. The high poly, it doesn't really matter. The high polys can be 20 millions because it's all baked, yeah. Anything else? Um, when oh, sorry, you, uh, you were another one? Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, when you're assembling the environments in Moto, is it just one artist assembling everything? Or uh, like for the overall environment? Yeah, yeah uh, basically yes. You need a lead that is basically come and picks everything together. Everybody is responsible for a, for a sector. And, uh, and then a lead uh, uh, artist just brings it together. If we are set so that uh, maybe a smaller environment that every artist can take actually the environment that it's all a freestyle ninja and generalist work. Yes? It was five. Uh, two of which uh, were a little bit younger, so they took a little bit of a month and a half, two months to get them to actually produce things properly, so involved a little bit of training. Yeah. This is the flexibility of working as generalists. You don't need 20 people uh, to do a ball. <laughs> you just can, yeah, can be flexible. Anything else? Yeah? You said because you didn't have access to the game engine, mm -hmm. you couldn't really test how the materials looked. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be more comfortable at the delivery phase to just have your art director fly on location and see the models live? Uh, well, we did that uh, uh, when we started the production. We flew to ourselves to Sweden. We, uh, we basically decided to choose a couple of uh, uh, calibration assets that would uh, represent a little bit of a uh, broad spectrum of, of challenges like glass, metal, wood, plastic uh, in, a, in a hole. Some of them were a bit more boxy, some of them more curvy, just to create a little bit of like broad uh, perspective. And uh, we developed them. We did a bunch of renders, like the table style, with passes, <coughs> and we get th got them to do the same with the same uh, with the same assets. Obviously, flying in person at every delivery that would be the the best idea. But like you know, life is hard sometimes. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's, yes, yeah. But yeah, that would have been the ideal thing, indeed. Another one, which is the uh, you show a slide with a normal and albedo, and then you have a specular mm -hmm. with a gloss in this map. Mm -hmm. Because, but then in the end, there are PBR materials. Uh, they are, yeah. So which one of those represents the metallicness or the roughness? 
Uh, well, the meta in, if you use uh, spec gloss uh, metallicness, it's just not part of the calculation. It's actually um, how metallic it is, it's a result of the specular map because when specularity doesn't hit a certain level, that means there's a non-conductive material. So it's a dielectric that is not going to be a metal. When uh, specularity hits a little bit of higher levels, that probably is a conductive material and it's, and it's a metal. Yeah. And uh, that also, to a certain extent, uh, can uh, affect uh, the diffuse, the, the, color, the color map uh, as well. But uh, yeah, it's the specularity that is, uh, is actually driving the metallicness. It's, it's a f basically a mathematical formula. Yeah. That's it, right? And how long time did you guys uh, took working on this game? Talk Entirely, I, uh, the whole environment, it was six months. It was about six okay. months, yeah. Because okay. yeah. we finished this one and we jumped on other ones. They kind of started trusting us and just dropped more stuff on us. <laughs> yeah. So it, it takes some trust from the other company to delegate all this to you? Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about how they put this type of trust on your company? Like, they probably don't give this to any other... No, no, this is why, well, that uh, uh, beginning plate that I showed with all the background projects. Right, um, I knew somebody... That's basically, it's, it's two of us, it's Zoltan and me. And he is the, he's got about 20 years in video games, I got about 20 years in movies, so we got a bit of a big network of people that we're working right. on, we're working with. And thankfully we didn't screw it up too many times. Mm -hmm. So people have worked with us and they know that uh, we can do some good stuff. And that's it, so when, that's pretty much the point. It's about reputation, it's, it's, this is what I, what I was mentioning before. Out of school, Absolutely, yeah, it's all about reputation, it takes a long time, it takes a long time to get there, yeah. When you, when you showed those passes for the subway level, the concrete was fairly light, mm -hmm. bright, it was a, a light gray. Yeah. But then the final scene, it was extremely dark. It was like, how do you predict the lighting, especially when you say that sometimes the, the lighting artist would like to bake the light on the level? How do you uh, predict, because the color didn't change. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah that, that's where PBR comes in handy, because uh, there are ranges that are physically uh, tested. And, uh, and you can do the tests with the, also with the magma charts and you see how, how actually the real concrete in real life responds. So there are certain calibration processes such as taking a real photograph uh, of concrete in a real environment, maybe a studio environment, and you create that very studio environment uh, in CG with an HDRI and just literally photorealistically reproduced and with a magma chart just to make sure that the light spilling and the um, color um, the white is basically calibrated. And, uh, and when you get to get that concrete to work with the same exit working um, look inside of a CG simulated uh, environment, you can try with an opposite maybe, lighting setup maybe by night or with sunset. Uh, as long as you recreate it realistically in, uh, in CGI, eventually you have those parameters. And then there are, there are charts literally of, uh, there is a French company called Don't Nod that did a lot of research about uh, um, values of albedos, the value of specularities uh, on different materials. And those defines the, the ranges. Um, you, also in the physically based book, uh, rendering books, you can find those. And uh, so it's a little bit of a mathematical thing eventually. So this is why it's cool that we're getting there. We were starting to, it's not an opinion anymore. Like um, I think concrete is dark, I think concrete is bright. It's a little bit more scientific now and it tends to respond. But from an artistic standpoint, uh, yeah, we try to work our assets. Those renders were in a limbo, so there was a bright gray and like a generic studio lighting, but we try to look dev the assets with an HDRI, with a working environment that is as similar as possible, if not the same as the lighting of the level, which takes a little bit of conversation to, or initiative from, av, from us, or conversation with the actual client to say, what is going to be the lighting? And they were, for the, for the subway, they were sending us nice uh, videos and references of how were they progressing with the light for us to know. I have one question. Uh, do you split the, the floors and the walls? And if there is like a predefined number of poles when you decide to split, I'm saying this because when the camera is not looking, we don't want to draw a big object. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of like a big wall, mm -hmm. like 50 meters mm -hmm. or something like that, and the player is looking like half yeah. of an object. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
specific limit? Uh, it, de it, depends, it depends mainly on the overall scale of the environment and on the kind of action that is happening inside of it. So it's a tricky decision to take all the times so because obviously uh, the, the less pieces uh, it, the, the, the module is made, the more custom details you can put on. But obviously, the more split it is, the more risk you have for repetition, but the less calls you're going to have because you can load them progressively. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's pretty much a case-by-case case kind of situation. It's mainly based on that primary, secondary, and tertiary POVs thing that I showed before. Uh, we try to keep that in consideration and say, say, where is going to be most likely looking like? But that's the thing. You cannot prevent anybody at home to just looking exactly opposite where you are hoping him to look. <laughs> so. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.